The content presented in this program is for informational and educational purposes only. You should not construe any information as legal, tax, or financial advice. Any information presented should never be used without first assessing your own personal and financial situation or without consulting a financial, legal, or tax professional. And while I am honored to be here today, thank you for spending your Saturday morning with us. And hopefully I'll have an opportunity to answer any questions. So we will have a mic in the back if you have a question question, please let us know and we will bring the mic to you because we are also live streaming this. Uh, so we are here this morning to talk about navigating college and scholarship ready. This is a parent's guide to unlocking opportunity. And we know in order to unlock opportunity, you need to have keys. And so hopefully you will leave today with a couple of keys to help you unlock some opportunities for your student. So I'm very excited to be here this morning. So I just want to give you an overview of our agenda for this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about college readiness. And I went and looked at many definitions of college readiness. So I want to give you a framework for what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about academic uh, exploration and preparation, extracurricular involvement, and how that plays into being college ready. And then part two will be preparation for scholarships. A lot of parents want to know when should you start applying for scholarships. Uh, we're going to talk about those components, the SAT, which is one of those keys that helps unlocks opportunities for our students. We're going to talk about scholars program and scholarship search engines and your scholarship, your student scholarship portfolio. So let's get started. So a quick write activity and a quick write activity is just where you write down quickly uh, an, uh, the answer to this prompt. So list three three dreams you have for your child 10 years from today. So take their age plus 10 years and think about a dream you have and dream big. I'll share one of my dreams that I have for my children. I dream that they don't live paycheck to paycheck. They have a career that they enjoy. And so think about a dream. And the difference between a dream and a goal, a goal has a date. Like to graduate high school, that's a goal. A dream is something that's big that you want them always to be aspiring to. I want my, my children to be responsible citizens. I want them to participate in a democratic process of voting. I want them to be educated voters. So think about your dreams you have for your students. And I, wanna, I want someone to share out and students, I want you to think about dreams you have for yourself. Okay, we have, we have one person right here. They're bringing you to Mike. All right, good morning. So the dream I have for both my boys is that they have promising careers and make enough money to pay me back for <laughs> all the things that I've done for them over the years of going through high school. That's a great, that's great, that's great. Did y'all get that? Did y'all write that down? <laughs> Anybody else? One more person, right. Okay, uh, I'll take a stab at it. Um, for me, uh, in, uh, in order of importance, financial security, freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, second is able to impact the communities in which you, you live uh, and those that are challenged. Uh, third is uh, for her, this is my daughter, mm -hmm. uh, to have the vision to uh, make a 40-year-old decision and she's 18. Because mm. you know when you're making that decision and you're 18 years old and, and when you turn 40, it's mm. like, well, <laughs> how do you do that? So hopefully she has a vision or dream or something that guides her along with what we've done so she can make the best decision. Okay, good. All right, thank you for participating in that activity. I love to start, up, start out with an activity that requires us to think about the dreams we have for our children. Because when they were little, 
we were dreaming of the day when they could walk and then we were dreaming of the day that uh, they would go to school and then now they're in high school when they graduate and uh, go off to college. But what's the underlining things that we want for, the, for our students? What are those skills that they need to have to be prepared for their future? So education is the key to unlock the golden door of freedom, George Washington Carver. This quote just helps me really put in perspective what education is. If we're talking about having a key to unlock opportunities, education is the key. And we wanna make sure our students have that. And so I always like to start off with data. I work for economic mobility systems and we look at data all the time. And we know as uh, parents that we want our students to be financially free, to have opportunity. And we look at the progression of, okay, the unemployment rate compared to the education level and the weekly incomes. And we're not gonna focus so much on the dollars, but what, we're, what we are gonna focus is on, oh, where do you have the most opportunity? Where is the unemployment rate the lowest? And this came out in 2021. And so you wanna think about that. And, and the reason why I show this slide, because nobody, no good parent says, I want my student to graduate from high school and make $16,000 for the next five years. Because that's not gonna help them reach those dreams that we have for them. Or I just want my, 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 my child to scrape by and be a slave to a paycheck. And so we have to think about these things now. And we have to have these discussions with our students now so they can know why we are pushing them so hard. Because I know my two children I push them hard because I'm like, I want to make sure you have opportunities I didn't have. And I want you to benefit from everything that I've learned and be able to take it to the next level because you're going to have challenges that I didn't have. Like I didn't grow up with social media. I don't know how they deal with all the social media antics and posts and everything all the time. And uh, it's a lot. I was like, that would have drove me crazy, <laughs> but it's a lot. And so when you think about college readiness, I want you to think more about what your student needs are for academic preparedness, <coughs> what their study skills are, information and literacy. This is something that we didn't have to deal with when we were coming up. We didn't have all, we didn't have Google we didn't have chat GBT, GPT, uh, written, written communication, their writing, self-advocacy. Like, how, do they know where to go when they need help? Do they know how to ask for help? And then adaptability and resilience. And this is the adaptability and resilience is the most important. You need to be academically prepared. I worked with first generation students at UT Dallas and some of them came from under-resourced schools and they were not as academically prepared as their peers. But tell me why our program had a higher graduation rate than the university? Because of adaptability and resilience. They knew how to study and because they were not given those resources in high school, when they got to college and people actually gave them water, they took advantage of it. And they were ready to excel and they did so. And so what does academic preparedness look like? And notice I don't have on here, you need to take AP courses, dual credit courses. Take the courses that you wanna take 
but make sure those courses involve critical thinking, problem solving, and you're developing analytical skills. And if that's not happening in the high school, then you have to find other programs outside of the high school where that will happen because you need to have critical thinking, problem solving, analytical skills. The study skills. A lot of students these days are telling me, I don't have to study. School is easy. Well, college is not. School might be easy, but college is not. So developing study habits, time management skills, note taking. Oh, I'm getting, I'm getting some head nods back here. <laughs> Would you like to share? Because you are just. Uh, well, I was definitely one of the ones that was like, the oh, mic. school is easy. I was definitely one of those ones where I thought school was easy. In high school, I did I never studied. Um, but when I got to college, I didn't realize that, you know, I wasn't able to um, continue that bad habit. So I had to learn how to study and um, how to practice time management skills and things of that nature. So I definitely agree with you on that. And so you were, be, you were able to adapt and you were resilient. And again, practicing that now, like my, my two children, they have crazy schedules. So I know they know how to do time management, but at college, I'm managing their time. I'm good at time management. But what happens when they go off to college? And so you have to think about these things and how do you help your child learn how to manage their time uh, wisely. Any questions? Yes, sir. Do you know how you mentioned that we should not necessarily not shouldn't take AP or dual credit classes? Are they still helpful for us if we do take them? Oh, yes, yeah. definitely. Uh, you want to take the most rigorous course that your high school provides. Like you want to take AP classes. You want to take if they offer AP uh, dual credit classes. You want to also check and see uh, uh, at the school with the counselor, like how is your AP teacher doing like are the AP students getting the three and four on those AP exams? They have that data, they have that record of what the AP teachers are doing because what you want is you wanna be challenged. You don't wanna be in a class where you're not challenged because that's how you develop that academic preparedness. All right, thank you. Thank you for your question. Oh, oh we have a question in the back. <laughs> Well, not even as a question, but as a parent, um, so I do have a college age child, but I think as a parent being involved, if your child does have an AP class, yes. um, because I had our particular um, instructor, she was not teaching my child. And so that you really are having those conversations and you're listening to make sure that they are prepared for the test going in so that mm -hmm. they can have the credit. I know some of the schools are moving away from AP and they're partnering with UT, um, on UTA ramps. on ramps. And so I would say take advantage more of on ramps than AP because even the AP class, the test, one of her credits transferred for AP, the other did not, but the on ramps did. So I would really start maybe even steering mm -hmm. towards on ramps versus AP now. Okay, thank you. Oh, you had a question in the back. Okay. Okay. Yes, we we jump right in. More or less on the AP subject and like dual credit subject. Would you recommend uh, students go more towards dual credit? Uh, as as somebody who was in AP courses throughout his entire high school, would you recommend more towards dual credit? As I've noticed that a lot of the people who are in AP classes tend to drop out of them significantly quicker. Mm -hmm. And it tends to affect their GPA a lot more than going into dual credit where it's a little bit more manageable. Uh, I always tell students, your high school, your high school will determine what you focus in on. Like dual credit classes, once you pass that class, you have the college credit. AP classes, you have to pass the college board test. And college board has done an excellent job of putting all the resources online. Like when COVID happened, College Board was able to pivot. They put all of their lectures online. So if you're taking, let's just say next year you're taking AP Biology, 
Well, in the summer, you can go look at some of those AP biology lessons and get a head start. Take some notes. Be ready for when your classes start. And so it just depends on the high school. And you can do a mix. Uh, I see students that they, they like, oh, I love AP uh, Lang and I want to just take dual credit economic and government my senior year. And so if you want if you want to do a mix, then do a mix. Uh, but you want to talk to your parents and your counselor about your uh, your academic courses. And the students have already chosen their academic courses. Uh, they had to do course selections back in March. April time frame, so you want to you want to go ahead and get their schedule because they have it for next year already. Any other questions? But uh, for our session today, college readiness is a comprehensive comprehensive preparation designed to equip students with the skills and knowledge for a successful transition to college and career opportunities. So traditionally, college readiness has been uh, thought of as if your student has passed TSI and they're ready to matriculate into uh, a college course without taking remedial courses. But it's so much more than remedial courses because if you have this adaptability and resilience, you might take a remedial course, but because you had that skill gap and now those skills have been, uh, that gap has been filled, you're ready to run full force ahead. So you have to decide on you know, what's best for your student moving forward. And so uh, this is a number of, of degree holders uh, from 2000 to 2018. T 2000 is in the red and 2018 is in the blue. The number of students that are actually getting a bachelor's degree has declined. People are saying that bachelor's, like why do I need a bachelor's degree? What's the benefit of having a bachelor's degree? But if that's one, of, if your dream is to like be a lawyer, you will need a bachelor's degree before you can go to get a law, law degree or if you want to be a doctor. So it depends on your career path. Uh, a lot of people are into micro credentialing now, but this workshop is strictly on college. So that's what I'm going to spend my time talking about is college and making sure that you are equipped to move forward with helping your student go to college and know that uh, it is possible. College is, is not just going to be your dream. It's going to be a re reality for your students. And I'm going to have to plug in my computer because it just said it's my battery is low. So I want you to think about, uh, I always start with the growth mindset. It's making sure students have that growth mindset and that that growth mindset is being reinforced because there are too many people walking the school building that have fixed mindsets on the ability of students. And so it's important that we help our students understand that, okay, you might not get it just yet, or these are your grades now, but there's a way to improve it and not think about, oh, I'm just not good at math because that's a skill, you can build it. And if you, uh, if you work at it, you'll get better. It's just like anything else. It's just like going to the gym. Uh, it's just like playing a sport. If you work at it, you'll, you'll get better. And where I've seen the growth mindset most in play is in sports. They practice every day before and after school. Their coach, they have coaches that help them refine those areas that they need to develop and strengthen the skills that they have. Why can't we do this with academics? Why can't we have, if we know the Olympics of academics is, let's say SAT, when do people start preparing for the Olympics? 
like like Many years before. Simone Biles. Huh? When did she start preparing to go to the Olympics? She was elementary. Yeah. When did she have that dream? So she, so how old do you think she was when she woke up and like, I'm going to the Olympics? When do you think? Yes. Um, just watching her, I feel like, she, you know, gymnastics, they start as young as four years old, I believe. Okay. And what did her parents have to do to support that dream? <laughs> they had to find a trainer. They had to co uh, find a coach. They had to create the environment. Um, move. Move. Wow. What about Venus and Serena? Who had that dream? The dad had it. The dad Who fulfilled sure. it? When did they start? And so all I'm saying is if you think about like who has the dream, when is the dream realized, and who benefits from the dream? You say everybody? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and every generation after them, right? Correct. Right. And so. Open up doors for women of color that would not have been open. Oh, they bringing you the mic because they want, want, those are some really great comments. Um, it was Richard Williams' dream initially, but he had them open up doors for women of color that might not have been open at that time had he not had that dream for his daughters. And he put pressure in and things on them that they didn't want at that time, but it was very beneficial, like I say, for young girls and women of color. I, this needs to be plugged in, I can't reach. Uh, and so they had to have this growth mindset in order to continue to aspire to get better and be the best. And that's what I, that's what we want for our kids. We want that aspiration to be inside of them. And not just for just academic preparation. Um, we want it in them for going after their goals for everything. And so this is one of those things that I constantly stay on my two about. When they were like, oh, I can't do it. I'm like, is that the growth mindset that we are? <laughs> supposed to have and so I love this quote because it's so real we must prepare students for a future we can neither describe nor predict and so I tell students they were like well what should I what should I major in what do I need to do I'm like you have to find out where your interests are because nobody predicted there would be a COVID shutdown this AI that's running rapid, that is gonna create the future for the students in this room. How can they be aligned to take advantage of those new opportunities that AI is gonna present? Uh, how can they research for cures for diseases we haven't invented yet? I know that uh, one of the big things in environmental science right now is sustainability. Like how is the earth going to be able to sustain all the people that's on it? And so there are going to be a lot of new careers open up because I was thinking when I graduated in 1994, everybody didn't have a cell phone. 
So programming a cell phone, programming apps on a cell phone wasn't even an option for me. Because if they, they had cell phones, they hadn't made it to our community yet. You know, they had those big old car phones. Y'all remember those big, the, with the carry case? Yeah, I showed my, I showed uh, my daughter one of the phones, the rotary phones. She was like, what's that? Like you have to dial, you have to dial. Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. That's okay. <laughs> but do you see that there's a future coming and we have to have, our students have to be prepared to take advantage of the opportunities in a future that we don't know what careers will be on the rise. And I told parents that we can't prepare them for our present. Like, oh, just go and be an engineer. We have to prepare them for their future. And we don't know how that's going to look. But we know that there are some core values they need to have. And we know that there are some core skills they need to have. And we need to think about how we can help them along the way. And so I came up with um, just some things that students need to have mastered in each of these milestones, like pre-K through five is their elementary years. During elementary years, they need to master their literacy skills, numeracy. They need to be comfortable with the numbers. The creativity and imagination. I think that because they have these cell phones and devices now, that something has been lost with their creativity and imagination. Uh, I'm a Sunday school teacher and I teach the three and four year olds. And you can give three and four year olds, you know, some blocks and they will create castles and do a lot of different things. But when you have three and four year olds coming to you talking about, give me your phone. No, it's creativity and imagination time. Just, they just want give me your phone. I'm like, no, we in Sunday school, no. You know, we gonna learn about Jesus because he loves the little children. Uh, our social skills. This is when they are developing social skills. Sixth through eighth grade, uh, collaboration and teamwork. Uh, this is when they usually find a sport that they, they're interested in and they'll stick with it. Uh, Pre-K through five, they might be going through several sports, except uh, the, the students that are getting involved in the football. When they are playing Pop Warner football, they usually play it all the way through high school. That's what I've seen. Uh, problem solving. Uh, how to make social adjustments. Again, thinking about helping them be self-directed learners. Um, and in being a self-directed learner, they find something they're interested in and they teach themselves. Whether it's how to crochet or how to program or how to play the guitar but they find something that they love and they learn because it's out there because we have Google. You can pretty much learn anything. Ninth through 12th grade is career exploration. Uh, in Mesquite, I, Mesquite ISD, they have uh, a platform called Zello and Zello has like the career assessments on it and the students go in and take these assessments and they tell them uh, different things. They take their learning style assessment uh, they t also do that in uh, middle school as well. Uh, financial literacy, they need to know how to be responsible with money because that's a big thing when it's time for them to go off to college. They have to learn financial responsibility and then doing their college research, finding out what's going to work for them, the best fit college with the best financial uh, aid and scholarship plan. Any questions? about uh, the preparation for opportunity. And notice I didn't say I, on here, again, I don't have a list of classes that they need to take because they can learn these skills outside of school. And that's, you know, 
They spend a lot of time in school, but we know all schools are not created equal. And so if they're not getting it at school, they have to get it somewhere. And we want to make sure that we are thinking about some of the places that they can get these skills. And again, I told you I was a Sunday school teacher. And some of these skills are developed in Sunday school when they are asked to be a part of Christmas programs, Easter programs. Uh, they are forced to get out of that comfort zone. And I, I always say not enough students are at Sunday school. <laughs> They're missing some key lessons. Uh, but there are also other places, the Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts. Uh, there are a lot of different programs. Yes. She's bringing the mic. I know you have social skills down for pre-K through five. Oh, no, these continue on. This oh, okay. is in a, di like, you learn this and you keep learning it. <laughs> it's oh, okay. a continuum. Okay, okay. Because yeah, I was about to say that social skills I've learned, especially since COVID, has been something, oh. even in adults, that we are losing <laughs> The, uh, depending on the type of education, because if you're being homeschooled, it, homeschool might be great, but social skills is something that it, it gets lost in the homeschool because you're not getting as much exposure. Um, and I, I, I didn't know that it was something that you were saying that needs to come, like, continue to carry oh, on. No, but I do no. know that yeah, social no. skills is very, very important in today's times. This um, is depending a continuum. On that. So you okay. add your... The literacy skills in sixth and eighth grade, they look a little different. The numeracy skills, uh, you're learning how to do algebra now. You, you still need these skills. And then when you are in ninth and twelfth grade, you need these skills. Uh, and But you also need to know how to collaborate and work at a team. You also need to be problem solving. So these, these, this, these skills build on each other. And then when you go off to college, you need some of those same skills. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So I included this information because I think this is very important uh, about reading and making sure students are reading above grade level. And I had literacy on the first one because it's not just reading. It's reading for comprehension and understanding and synthesizing and analyzing the text. Uh, that the students need to uh, be at. They're able, they're, we looked at, again, I told you we look at a lot of data where I, where I work, but the third grade reading scores, and the third grade reading scores will predict if you're going to be a high achiever in grade eight. Because if your reading is not on level, you kind of disengage from school because it's not fun, because you are struggling in that area. So we need to take the same approach that uh, they take in sports. We need to hire a coach. We need to practice before school and after school. That same, those same principles apply. Like when you find a model that works, you just take that model and apply it to a different situation. And these are third grade, this is third grade reading. And so I encourage parents to just figure out where their children are, whether they're in ninth grade, 10th grade, or 12th grade. If they are not reading above level, just one grade level, like if you're in the ninth grade, you should be reading at 10th grade level. So you can be understanding, able to synthesize, able to analyze and understand the text and what it's, it's, it's telling you. Because the test that they have to take to unlock opportunities for these scholarships, because you're really gonna have to be looking at merit-based scholarships. You really need to be looking at merit-based. There are a lot of need-based out there, but merit-based brings you the money. And I'll show you, you that in a minute. Any questions? When was this survey taken? Uh, I think this was in 2020. But yeah. 
uh, and this was not a survey. They took the, the test scores of all third graders and they looked at them over, uh, it was a longitudinal study that they looked at until they got into the eighth grade to see who was, who was at the top of the class and they went back and looked at their third grade. Now districts do, districts do this all the time. They look at what year do students start taking STAR test? Third grade. And so they have all of this data that they have and they can, they can pretty much predict who's gonna be successful in school based on those third grade STAR tests. And then they decide, like, okay, if you were in this percentile, if you were in the 71, 80 percentile, we're going to give you additional opportunities to have uh, exposure. If you're in this 81, 90, we're going to put you in gifted and talented. If you were in, in the 11, these two percentiles, we're going to pull you out of class and make you read while all your other friends are in class learning different things. We're gonna do interventions, they call them interventions. And I'm like, y'all, these interventions are not working. Cause who wants to be pulled out of class to go and read in the library when, when you think everybody's having a party in class? And so I know when I was in Grand Prairie, we were looking at ways to have students engage in a software platform that would allow all readers to start at their level and level up, especially in the uh, uh, earlier grades. Uh, summer learning. It's important to, I, I was saying like, you can't depend on, uh, I, gotta, I gotta speed up y'all, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm taking my time, but I'll, I'll, I'll go faster because it's almost time. So summer learning, uh, again, I was saying self-directed learning. You want to make sure students have opportunities for self-directed learning. There are a lot of different programs out there. I didn't list them all, um, uh, but Khan Academy is an online program to help them with any of the math skills that uh, they need to look at. Uh, edX, is a wonderful resource. They offer free online courses from uh, Ivy League schools that they can go to go through. And these are six week online courses. They don't get credit for it at the high school or anything. But if they're having problems in writing or they need extra support in any of they, they even have a college readiness course uh, at edX that uh, for parents, it's like a a five to six week class. I'm not for sure exactly how long the class is. But Dallas Summer has a reading program for the younger students, but um, AP has a reading list for the students. There's an AP reading list for every grade level. And so you can go to College Board and look at or contact the AP department at your school to find out what that reading list is and read those books so you can know what's, you know, what's going on, because it's, it's like uh, all the students across the nation are reading these books. Well, they're supposed to be reading these books. <laughs> uh, the Dallas Museum of Art uh, has a, pro uh, well, it's free. You, they have workshops and, and things for the younger, younger students. And so uh, thinking about what does your family like to do during the summer to encourage learning? Like what anybody, would you like to share, like, what does your family do to encourage learning? I can share one of the things that we did when, the, uh, when my children were smaller. We had a park research project. So we would go to all the parks to see which was the best park in Dallas. And, and just kind of on a scale of one to five, we would rate the parks just to see it was something fun to do and uh, it made them think because again, we need, they need to think about stuff. Yes. So during the summer, um, 
I have twins. Um, so during the summer, we used to enroll. I used to enroll them in uh, Dallas summer reading programs, mm -hmm. uh, as well as the uh, the subtle reading programs. Yeah. And they like going different places. So in order for us to go to the Ranger games, in order for them to get like free. Uh, Chick-fil-A coupons or whatever the favorite place was, I would look at what the prizes was. Mm -hmm. So they used to have to read, yeah. um, read the books, and then they would have to log in the books, and then we would go to the library, and then we would spend time on the computer. And then as they reap the rewards, like we went to Dallas Stars um, mm -hmm. rink, and they was able to ice skate for free. Um, different things. We went to the museum. We went to the Ranger game. So it got to the point where every summer they were looking forward to these these rewards, but at the same time, they were learning. So it was kind of like, I'm, I'm teaching you and I'm, I'm pushing you without the pressure of always being on, the back, on their backs. And then they were enjoying the computers. And then we were also building relationships to the point where they liked the library. So it was like, well, can you take me to the library? And then I was able to drop them off at the library and they could engage with the librarians without being supervised. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, that's a really great uh, way to spend summer. Yes, Ms. Mayo. Question, did you set the incentives or did they come with the program? They Are those? The program. Yeah, they came with the program. Yeah, they come with the program. Oh, okay. Yeah, they come with the program, which is great. Uh, here are a couple of career exploration websites that uh, students can uh, engage in over the summer. Um, Navigate um, is a program that is provided uh, by the Dallas Fed and it's actually a little curriculum that they can go to and it's a little workbook that they can work through online. Big Future by College Board. Uh, College Board has some really great resources for students and parents. Uh, they have resources for college exploration as well. Uh, College Forward um, is a website uh, and I really love this one because they have Texas reality check and the Texas reality check allows students to go in and put down what type of house they want what type of car they want how they want to live how often they want to shop and it tells them how much money they need to be making in a year to live that lifestyle and I love it because they were like and I'm like mm, you're not gonna be making 85,000 out of fresh out of college unless you're doing a career that's really in high demand. So you might want to think about all these things you want. But Texas Reality Check is a really great resource. And Career One Stop is uh, the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, they have a wonderful exploration too. They have uh, career assessments and pro career profiles on it. So this, these are great websites uh, for, uh, for you to explore with your student. I always try to give uh, examples of resources that you can go to find opportunities and get more information. Uh, extracurricular activities. So again, we're talking about being college ready. So you want to make sure that your student is engaged in extracurricular activities because it helps to develop that leadership that you want them to have. It encourages the teamwork. Uh, it's a great way for them to be involved in the community. Um, and build self-confidence. Some of the programs that I listed here are national programs, uh, and some are, uh, might be at your school. But what I like about these organizations, they also offer scholarships, and they have opportunities for local, regional, and national uh, leadership positions. So they elect officers. Uh, I recently went to a DECA competition at the state level it was at the Hilton Anatole. All the DECA students from across the state were there. Uh, and it was, it was so many students. It was amazing. I was like, this is great. This is, this is great exposure, great networking, uh, great opportunity for them to be engaged. And these organizations are also uh, at the collegiate level. They have... Uh, high school components and if it's not at your high school some of them have chapters that you can join uh, like uh, the national society of black engineers they have junior chapters and you can be a part of uh, their junior chapter 
So I say look into a career and technical uh, student organization uh, because it, it, give you, it gives you the opportunity to explore some of your career opportunities. I do not know exactly what it stands for. It's, it's, it's one, it's, it's related to the business pathway. That's all I can tell you about DECA. I don't know exactly what it stands for, but it, 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 it's an opportunity for, uh, for them to meet other students and network. Uh, the Presidential Volunteer Service Award. This is an opportunity that some school districts have where they will give awards based on the number of community service hours that the student completes. And if your school doesn't do it, if you're a part of the CTSO, they, will, they also award the Presidential Service Award. If you're not a part of a CTSO, Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, they also and uh, I am going to work with my church, uh, Ms. Mayo, to make sure that we can offer presidential service awards to our youth. Because you, you, all you have to do is become a certified organization. And that means that you will certify the volunteer hours and you, will, you can then have access to order the awards. I bought this program, the Grand Prairie ISD, and they now are uh, encouraging students to be involved in the community and give back. And so if you uh, complete 100 hours, uh, you receive a gold award. And the gold award is a gold medal and a signed letter for President Biden. That's what the students received. Yeah. OK, so Boy Scouts, yes, they do that. They do little things. The five to ten, ten year olds, they still can volunteer. They can help clean up. Uh, yes. And so uh, the big future ambassadors, they are, this is a, a program through College Board that they can enroll in independently at their school, uh, even if their school doesn't have this. Uh, and they become part of a network of students around the country that promote uh, the scholarships of College Board, which range from 500 to $40,000. And again, it's not income restricted. Okay, part two, and we're gonna have to go a little faster, is <laughs> preparation for scholarships. Parents wanna know what SAT score does my child need in order for them to get scholarships? Where do we need to be? We need to be at the competitive score level. The competitive score level, 1,200, 13, 20. That's where you need to be. When can students start taking SAT? Hmm? They can start taking, when can they start taking it? Freshman year. Freshman year? They can start taking it at seventh grade. Freshman year. Uh, but they only the scores are only good at four years. I found out that there was a private school that was giving the SAT to their students every year until they reached that competitive score. So if they got that competitive score in ninth grade, they didn't have to take it again. And guess what? They won it. That competitive score at ninth grade, so they wouldn't have to take it again. And uh, and they would be set for senior year. But most colleges super score. And super score means that they will take your highest score in math from a test you took at 10th grade when you had a really great math teacher and your ELA scores from your junior year when you had an outstanding ELA, ELA teacher that had a master's degree. And so they will take scores from different years. And so I encourage parents to test uh, their students to just to see where they are. Test the students just to see where they are. And because these scores matter, because these scholarships, scholarship programs matter. Scholar programs are four-year programs that come with mentorship and internships. It's not just about the money. And so most uh, 
colleges have really great presidential uh, scholar programs. And I just named a few. Uh, the Round Brown Scholar Program, Jackie Robbins Scholars, uh, the Hunt Leadership Program at SMU, those are all great programs with all great uh, incentives to do well, right? Those some good incentives? <laughs> scholarship search engines. Uh, scholarship search engines will allow you to look for scholarships starting as early as ninth grade for your student. And so uh, I just warn parents just to be careful because they have to make sure that it's not uh, a sweet stakes or uh, a raffle kind of thing because you don't want to give out all your information to something that is not a real scho a scholarship. That's just a marketing uh, promotion. The scholarship portfolio, which is what my friend Diego will need, uh, in the 11th grade, you need to have your resume, your transcript. You won't have a student aid report until your senior year, but you need to start gathering these things so you can have them and you can be ready for it. And you also need to go ahead and get your scholarship essay. Uh, go ahead and start writing that now. Like if you're in this workshop, just go ahead and start writing it and get people to proof it and make sure it is what it needs to be. A record of community service hours. If you do presidential service award, not only will you have a record of your community service hours, you will have a letter from the president. Recommendation letters, start collecting them uh, throughout high school from your coaches, from your teachers, from community leaders, and you will need your SAT, ACT school report. Uh, this is just information on how you can build a strong scholarship application. Uh, in addition to what I told you earlier, you would need a nice uh, photo because a lot of scholarships are asking you for your photos now. Uh, and you want to make sure, like they make copies before submitting. Uh, this information is from Texas On Course. Texas On Course is a really great resource for parents and students. But uh, most, most uh, applications are not paper, they're online. And so I would like to leave you with this quote, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. Your goal is your desired outcome. Your system is the collection of daily habits that will get you there. This is James Clear from Atomic Habits. Oh, and this is the last slide I just added, and this is for the NCAA, this is for all our student athletes. It is just the outline of what you need to be doing each year to be ready for, uh, to ready to play sports uh, during your college time. And so I would like one person to share some takeaway that you had for our time together today. Just, okay. A, um, a large takeaway for me that I'd like to share and try and pass on to my kiddos every day is the growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Yes. Extremely important. Extremely important. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? All right. Well, thank you so much. This is my uh, email information. I will be around a little bit afterwards. If you have any questions, I would love to stay and answer them. Thank you for spending out of your time with me this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching our Empower Series YouTube video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Remember to hit the subscribe button below as well as the little button to be notified the next time we upload our video. Until then, stay connected with us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever your social media flavor is. Inspire the world to thrive. See you soon.